Happy Wednesday, everybody, or whatever day it is that you're that you're catching our our podcast with my co-host Sean Francis. I am Brian Altunian, and you are catching another episode of Just Two Dads. Today we had a last-minute cancellation. Our guest, uh, our proposed guest, uh, Billy Price, had to have a, had to have a procedure done and uh, is in recovery. So first of all, we want to wish you well, Billy, and hope that you. Uh, that you have a speedy recovery, and we can't wait to get you on the show because that's going to be an amazing show. So today we have a um, we have a bunch of topics that Sean and I are going to cover. Basically, it's a conversation between just two dads. So catch us here on, on today's episode, just two dads. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good day wherever you are. Uh, I am Brian Altunian, another episode of Just Two Dads. I uh, want to thank everybody for who catches us live on Facebook. Welcome. Please put comments. This is, I think, going to be a free flow. We have a few topics we want to cover today, but we have a free flow conversation. So if you're catching us on Facebook, hello. Uh, leave us comments. If you're on YouTube, uh, seeing us on, the, on our YouTube channel at We Are Just Two Dads, we hope that you leave some comments and please subscribe and share the share the episodes with your friends and people that you that you know and love. And if you're catching us on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, anywhere that podcasts uh, exist, welcome. We hope that uh, we're entertaining and engaging and hopefully that uh, you get some value out of the work that we do. And for our family and friends out in the U.S. Virgin Islands, who are catching us on WSTX AM radio. Welcome. Uh, can't wait to see you all. And uh, thank you for joining us here on Just Two Dads. So without further ado, my name is Brian Altunian. A couple of years ago, um, my partner in Thrive, my, my uh, partner in, I, we cannot say partner in crime, by the way, even though that's, a, that's something that everybody says, right? We're in the financial mm -hmm. services business for crying out loud. We can't say partner in crime. But uh, my partner in Thrive, actually, I'll just go back really quickly. Six and a half years ago, I started... Uh, I started a new venture in uh, in the financial services world, and uh, just circumstantially, it just I, I was I was at it at, at an office with a whole bunch of people, and the people who invited me to the office that day were not there, and I didn't know that until I literally till I I walked in the door and uh, and learned they weren't there, and um, I was not happy because it, I live in Los Angeles, and any time that you drive anywhere from Los Angeles, it's not a short drive it, at rush hour traffic. Which, by the way, I think rush hour traffic in Los Angeles exists um, almost now 24 hours. Would you agree? Yes, most definitely. So I, I walked in the door and I was an hour and a half to get there. And then my friends weren't even there. And I was with a bunch of strange people that I didn't even know. And I made a beeline to the wall, <laughs> which I think is what we do sometimes. Um, which if you know me, you're like, that's weird. That's not you. You walk in a room and talk to everybody. But I didn't. I was like, I was out of my element. And the first person I ran to was this gentleman named Sean Francis who just sort of enveloped me with, you know, calmness, groundedness, just <laughs> love, just like, like just such kind of a cool vibe. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. I can hang with this guy. This is this guy's cool. As it turns out, that first moment, that first introduction was going to lead to not only a six and a half year um, friendship and, and family relationship, but really uh, it, it's turned into such a, a, a much larger such a, a larger involvement that has resulted in our podcast here, Just Two Dads, which we started about a year and a half ago. We're on episode number, what number are we? 60, 60, 63, I believe, two or three. Yeah, sure. 60, yeah, 63, 63 episodes. We do this weekly. Um, mm -hmm. Our first episodes were horrible. Uh, we were on <laughs> Facebook and like uh, on, I think on our phones, like, hey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I mean, it was really kind of a crazy thing, but that's true. Uh, it has changed my life because the work that we do as just two dads, just having a conversation about the issues that surround families who deal with um, family members who have special needs issues, disabilities, medically complex issues. Um, Sean and I bonded over a common crusade, which was make sure that we not only service the special needs community in the work that we do in financial services, but find the amazing warriors, and the amazing um, advocates for our children that are serving serving the special needs community and that that work transcends into neurotypical families as well. So um, so welcome everybody. And that was a very long introduction for me to say, you know, welcome to you, Sean Francis. Uh, great to see you as always. I'm excited to have this conversation. 
and um, and look, we're having friends pop on and say hello, which I love. Um, so yes, so uh, <laughs> hi, Gil. Um, so Sean Francis, how are you feeling today? Ha, huh. you. All, whenever you ask me that, I get ready to answer it, and it's like somebody at some point is going to believe that he really doesn't feel that way. But I feel thankful, blessed, and just energized i've had things take place lately that include the misfortune of other people as well as good news for other people that makes me happy for them and then appreciative of my own blessings and for us to have um, this friendship and this outlet and platform to discuss the things that we discussed i am eternally grateful and so we've discovered doing this show that we were wrong to think that there is such a thing as special needs because there is no such thing as special needs. Everyone has basic needs. Everyone has human needs. Those needs are the need to be heard, to be seen, to know that you matter, to know that you're loved, to know that you count, right? So any topic that we come up with here, generally speaking, you know, is something that um, affects any and everybody. It just happens to affect the special needs community 10 times as much. And so any topic that you can think of relates to the human experience. It just usually relates to one with special needs or someone who's caring for them um, in a considerably greater way. And so we've got a couple topics that we're going to cover today. Three of them. Um, we're going to be discussing the metaverse. What is it? How might that affect um, the special needs community? We're going to talk about the great resignation. And then last, we'll talk about something that we're very familiar with which is dear to our hearts, which is financial education and how each of those things affects the special needs community. So let's start with the metaverse. And let me ask you, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit. You're well-versed in it. Let's first talk about exactly what the metaverse is and how that can affect uh, the special needs community. And for those that don't know, the other thing is in relation to the metaverse coming, so to speak, in different platforms and outlets, there's talk that Facebook could um, as early as next week, change its name in order to suit uh, or be in alignment with their mission to bring to life the metaverse. So yeah. tell yeah. us what that is, Brian. So so first of all, the metaverse, it, it, it's funny. It's such a, it's such a, it, it's going to become one of these overused terms. And I think people who have been in the space already feel that it's already overused, but the metaverse is, it's basically the dig, a digital layer of our world that sits on top of our existing in real life world. So look, if you're older, you have gray hair like me, occasionally you'll see your kids, you know, they're texting and they and they type the IRL, right? IRL, like, what's IRL? I mean, it's in real life, right? I have a bunch of friends, but IRL, I have no friends, right? That's kind of the idea. <laughs> where, where so if you think about it, Facebook has been part of this metaverse concept for a long time because how many people post their, the image of their lives up on Facebook, their pictures of their, you know, their fun times, their going out, their meals, their, you know, they're, they're talking about, but we're, we're live on Facebook, right? So we're having this conversation live on Facebook, but, but in a way what's happened, and I think the pandemic created some, you know, some opportunity here for, for it to happen. In a way, people have taken social media and things like Facebook as almost a replacement for what happens in real life. And if you've got children and they're and they're uh, teenagers and they're on their their phones and they're on their mobile devices, you know sometimes their you know their entire social uh, social community and definitely for the last eighteen months a lot of their social interaction occurred over devices in a digital space where their digital persona may be different than their real life persona. So that's if you understand that right that your digital persona is different than your real life persona, you now understand the difference between the real universe and the metaverse, this digital existence that sits on top. What these companies are doing now, what companies in general around the world are doing is how do you create, uh, you know, another life, if you will, that sits on top of our life, but that interacts with our real world. So alternative artificial intelligence like Siri and Alexa, I'm pointing because my Alexa is over there. That's part of the metaverse. And so all of the all of the things that uh, all of the companies and the apps that Facebook has acquired over the last 10 years, Oculus is the, you know, is the the glasses that you put on to get you into into, uh, you know, virtual reality. Um, WhatsApp, which allows you to communicate around the world. 
um, again, Facebook, as we've mentioned, all of the things that they've done is part of this whole metaverse concept where you can live today in another world. So it's a fascinating concept for, for our, our, our world. And then for folks who are dealing with children with disabilities and special needs and other issues, it creates an opportunity. So depending on how you utilize it, it could create tremendous opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll use a real world example, and then we'll talk again about the special needs community. But, you know, if you've ever been in the, in the, in the, in the position to buy a house, for example, maybe you, maybe you want to buy a property in another state. Well, the idea of going house shopping in another state, it, it seems like it, it may be a costly, you know, and not very cost effective way of doing things. However, if you're able to go online and basically or, or put on glasses or whatever and basically do a, a real time walkthrough of the house that you're going to buy, that's an example of how the metaverse sitting on top of the universe can work. Right. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. so you could go tour a facility. You could tour. A, a, you could basically almost tour a restaurant, tour a factory, tour a home, tour an apartment building, tour any kind of business virtually. That's an example of, of how the metaverse works. So now if you think about children who have special needs, who may, be, who may have some limitation in mobility, the opportunity to have the experience that a neurotypical child may have who doesn't have issues you know, with mobility, the metaverse op, you know, could create an opportunity for folks to have a more well-rounded and more broader experience. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of... So just kind of talk cryptocurrency, by the way, and blockchain technology. That's another, it's another example of, of, of a play within the metaverse that, you know, folks can actually engage, conduct transactions, conduct business without using, you know, real dollars. By the way, it's global. So you can actually acquire something in another country and have the payment be, you know, be paid in a wallet that sits in yet another country. So it, it's, it's, again, creating a digital layer that exists on top of our real world. Does I think it's sense? another example, too, of how, you know, everything has its plus and minuses. You know, so it, 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 I hate to admit this because I, I consider myself to be one who's objective, open-minded, and always looking for the best in things. But I had to be reminded of the good that will come from it as you began your statement and it kind of jarred me for a second. I was like, Whoa, I, I didn't even realize I was being sucked down the road of what the challenge would be. And of course with that is, you know, it's one thing to escape to our true selves. In other words, I'm thinking of, um, you know, we have all these um, talent shows that consist of, um, you know, there's America's got talent, the American idol, then the voice and you got the mass singer. And then there's one that has, and, and where the person that's performing is an actual, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? You, uh, avatar of, oh. of the performer. And I don't even remember the name of the show. So I look like this, but when what you see or who you see getting up on stage singing is some other image, so to speak. There's some good in that if you shed your inhibitions and let loose with who you really and truly are. Right. But at the same time, if we lose who we are and get caught into who we almost pretend to be, that's where they ends up being this big problem. And if you're a parent to one with special needs to begin with, you're trying to shine as bright a light as you possibly can on exactly who your child is anyway. Right. And you want to make sure that you don't get into a situation where someone, you know, I don't know, for lack of a better term, hides behind a facade in terms of who other they might expect other people um, to be. That's just another part of the, you know, the human experience. And that's just one of the things that I'm thinking of, depending on what one's um, challenge or disability might be. Yeah. But I, I would say, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but I would say, I would say this also, you know, folks who are on the autism spectrum, one of the things that we say in common, whether we're a parent or we've experienced or we have a family member who, 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 who has, who has autism or is on the autism spectrum, is that the way that they process the world is completely different than how neurotypical people process the world, right? Yes. The yes. problem is, is that the, 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 the world that, that is neurotypical doesn't know how, like we're so, it's so funny. We're so like, if it's different than me, it's wrong. I don't want to understand it. I don't want to know about it. I don't want to yeah. learn about it, right? It's not my mm -hmm. thing. It's just not mine. So I'm just, it's just different. So let's leave it over there. 
Whereas if you could have, listen, if you could be neurotypical and have the, ex and have the experience of, of, if you could actually get that experience of, of, of processing Step in those the world, shoes. Yes, the way that it, somebody on the spectrum does, it could be, it could be mind blowing in such a good go. way, right? Yeah. And yeah. vice versa, if somebody who's processing the world through the lens of, of autism has a chance to then tap into the world because, you know, the, their world that makes sense to them is now laid out in front of them in a way that could be theoretically translated to something neurotypical. What a great, what, what a great opportunity that, that ex exists for us, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, empathy as we talk about all the time. It's understanding right. it's to your point, step into somebody else's shoes and, and get their experience, understand what it is that they're, that they're experiencing. Listen, we have, you know, we've had, Dan Habib on the show, right? And Dan's son Samuel has, you know, has a genetic disorder that you know prevents him from being mobile and you know, a number of other things. But but he can communicate because he has a communication device that allows him to communicate. And uh, and he's had and Dan has filmed uh, Samuel doing interviews of people all over the world. And you know clearly he can engage in conversation. Um, so we have some devices that enable folks who have had some challenges to overcome those challenges and be able to communicate in our world. How great would it be for us to be able to have something that let us communicate into their world, right? And, and coexist in a way with mutual understanding. To me, that, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of where this is all going. And it's funny, as you, that, side. Yeah. as you say that, that takes me to times where I, 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 I'm communicating with my son, Elijah, and I'm trying to figure out exactly what it's like to process what he's processing. And, you know, the same thing can be true of trying to figure out what is it, you know, I, I don't know how the technology would work for one to do that. But the same thing could be said of a man learning what it's like to step into a woman's shoes in terms of, you know, not, not yeah. from a fashion standpoint. No, no, no. Obviously, sure. you know, socially, things that you take for granted in terms of how people receive you. The same thing could take place from a cultural standpoint. You know, um, a person of color versus someone that is not, a person of a certain faith who is obvious by appearance versus one that is not. You know, there's there's a bunch of different ways to go in that direction. For sure, for sure. And and at the end of the day, any advancement in technology could be seen as, you know, have having sort of a sinister application. And I think that that's with anything, right? Um, ATM cards, right? You think of, a, of an ATM machine, an ATM card is fantastic, right? It gives convenience. Thinking about the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of ATM machines out there. Well, mm -hmm. you know, somebody gets a card that's not theirs or somebody, you know, has, has malintent and waits around ATM. You can, you can list all of the negatives that could possibly come with an ATM machine. You could fraud, uh, stealing your, 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 your account, blah, 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 blah. But you have to weigh, right? What's the what's the benefit to society versus the you know the few things that could possibly be be negatives, and do your best to try to minimize that, mitigate that, or regulate that to some degree. And I think that that's what what happens in the in the metaverse, which is why you know blockchain and cryptocurrency is uh, is is under so much scrutiny on a on a global scale because most countries' currency, right, is determined by by the government of that country and and government policy around currency um, is is unique. Obviously, some people say that they take the global marketplace into consideration, but I don't think the U.S. has ever really cared much about the world. And clearly, China doesn't care what the world thinks about their currency. They're their own. They're their own economy. And so so governments who dictate currency uh, policy are looking at cryptocurrency, which is a decentralized system to eliminate any of the any of the gameplay, you know, people don't realize that we're talking about a little bit about finance, but so people don't realize that the dollar has been devalued over a thousand times since its creation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people don't realize that. So when so, some folks are reading, you know, sort of the slanted media take on, you know, the dangers of cryptocurrency, they talk about, oh, well, it's devalued and, you know, you're not, in, nobody knows who's in control and you could lose your money. Well, you could say the same thing about every, every currency around the world. You could say the exact same thing, right? It's not controlled or who knows what's controlled or who makes the decisions about, about where the currency is going. Um, and so rather than put it in the hands of government who you may not agree with in your particular, in some one particular case, creating a, cent a decentralized um, uh, currency system that allows you to track transactions 
all the way to the very, very basic, you know, minute detail. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's a, that's a thing that prevents fraud and prevents some of the negatives. Now, the, again, the flip side of that as well, does that eliminate privacy? No, it doesn't. Privacy is right. It's one of those trade-offs. So, so regulators are trying to regulate, you know, how do you, how do you pr protect the, protect the, you know, the, um, the participants, the owners of the currency, how do you prevent fraud, right? How do you protect them? How do you protect mm -hmm. the privacy? How do you do certain things that I don't have, I, I, and I'd be curious to know how much money governments spend on, on, on anti uh, counterfeiting, uh, you know, and counterfeiting for, for years and years and years and years, right? right. We change our, our dollar, our paper dollars all the time based on counterfeiters. So people have been trying to defraud government when it comes to currency for since the beginning of currency. Um, yeah. So, so that, so, so my perspective is there's always going to be that. I, I remember telling my mom one time, we, we were talking about, and I'll, and I'll stop talking so you can get a word in otherwise here. <laughs> but I remember telling my mom, we were talking about uh, ATM machines. This was quite a long time ago. Um, and she said, well, I don't use an ATM machine because I don't want anybody to have access to my, my, my account information. I don't want anybody to know anything about me. I don't want anybody to know anything about me. It's completely private. I'm like, really? Let me, maybe, <laughs> let me go online and I'm going to show you. I'm going to type in your name just to see what people know about you. And, you know, it's pages and pages because, you know, she was in business. She was doing commercial real estate. I, it had her home address and her home phone number on the Internet. I'm like, how private is your life right now? <laughs> right. And so it totally blew her away. I think it made her mad. I don't think she talked to me for a couple of weeks. But but the bottom line is you can look at any of this stuff and go, you know, oh, it's just a horrible thing. The reality is the intent of most companies is to provide access to a digital world that, you know, that we can experience that is supposed to enhance the world that we live in, not mm -hmm. supplant it, not replace it, not, you know, not, not do anything, you know, other than enhance our experience. If you've ever used the internet to shop for groceries or buy a car or communicate with a friend, you're living in the metaverse already. It's just not been, it's just not been clearly defined. It's just amalgam of things at the moment. Right, right. And it'll be interesting to keep an eye on where that goes. And all of a sudden, you know, we start thinking of the good about it, you know, and we're talking about different points of view. I started thinking of a business model right away that could bring people together by showing what it's like to be in another person's shoes. Um in every category and subcategory subcategory that uh, one might be able to think of. Let's um move on to the great resignation. Yes. Um, this is, it's really, um you know, it, all it is is the term that I'm used to you using, which has been the great reset, the great reset. Um, you know, there's been some downsizing and things like that, that have taken place as a result of um, COVID and uh, companies being affected financially. But then there's also been an awakening for people that have, re-examine what is important to them. And again, this is something that if people are having this realization and in and, and wanting more control of their time and and giving more thought to how much time they spend working, who they work for, whose dreams they fund versus their own, that's got mm -hmm. to be something that again affects those of us caring for someone with special needs 10 times more so because but the, the sad part is that some of us aren't even going to realize that because we're so on autopilot when it comes to doing what we quote unquote got to do. Like the person that leaves the driveway, drives to work or drops the kids off at school, comes home. And every now and then you're like, I'm not sure how I got here because you just know what to do and that's all you do. So there's some of us that haven't had that awakening because they're still just on autopilot. But um, talk about, you know, what that is and, 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 and the shift that, um, people are, um, you know, are, are, are having, I, I'm, I'm always intrigued with having that conversation with you, generally speaking, because of who you are as a, as a person in terms of our personal conversation, but as a fellow special needs warrior and someone who prior to working in our business has been someone who worked as a CEO, raising funds and taking companies public and have had to make painful decisions in terms of downsizing and things like that. I'm interested in, um, you know, what your perspective is based on all of those things. Sure. Well, I would say, here's the thing. I don't, 
we've been we've been moving towards this for quite some time, in my opinion. Um, just the way with with digital technology being what it is, we've been moving towards this, but we needed a little push, and the pandemic created an opportunity globally to make this push. And I, in my opinion, I think that what we've seen is this this um, the jostling for the jostling of the term freedom. Okay. Mm -hmm. And freedom, I think is a magical word here because while some people are, are taking the divisive position of your mandates for vaccines and masks impinge on my freedoms, right? That they, they're sort of missing the mark. Like that's, I mean, I get it. Like if they have a personal issue with that, you know, I don't want to get political. People have a personal issue. Cool. If that's your thing. Go do that. But what you're missing is the opportunity to and what we're seeing right now is that what's created in the in the in the global psyche this is not just an american I issue this is i think a global issue is that people are realizing that first of all to your point the autopilot lives that we live in general is not freedom <laughs> in fact it's imprisonment to some degree um working the nine to five job is a sense of imprisonment we talk about you know, in our company that the job, the word J-O-B is, you know, a jail operating as a business because it's imprisonment. You know, you go to work for somebody and they give you everything. They give you your desk, your pencil, your computer, your, they tell you when to go, when to come in, when to go home, when to take lunch, when to take a vacation. If you can go and, 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 and see your kid's soccer game, you know, if you can take the weekend off, you know, we used to have a, there was a saying like, a, Hey, listen, if you don't show up on Saturday, don't bother showing up on Sunday, right? That was that's sort of the, the sort of the joke. Yeah, J-O-B, as Sean said, just over broke, right? But what people used to count, on, they used to think that that was something that they could count on, that it was just regularly they could count on so they could be in autopilot mode to do the things that they want to do, when the reality is they actually couldn't do the things they want to do because they had a job, or excuse me, they had, to, they had to ask for somebody for permission in order to take a day off to go do a personal development course or take the weekend to go do something. They had to ask somebody else for permission. So the, the misconception that having this working in the nine to five job is, is freedom is it's not. It's actual imprisonment. And the pandemic has created that because where some folks were fighting to have work from home be a normal thing. Hey, you know, boss, I'd be much more productive if I didn't have all this. You know, if I could just work from home, I'll, I'll, I'll be more productive at home doing the things I need to do. And I could probably do it in half the time. And, and, and companies were like, no, 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 no. We don't want that because why? Because we can't control what we you can't do. Control we can't your, control yeah. your activity. So mm -hmm. we don't know what you're doing. And, and, you know, if you're if you're in the kind of position where you say, well, my re the results of my work is what you're going to see. And at the end of the day, that's what you're paying me for. You know, some people don't realize that, you know, when you go to get a job, you go to take a job, you they, they you ask, what does the job pay? Right. Because most companies pay the position. They don't pay the person. The person. So you're already devalued walking in the door. You say, look, I've got a college degree. I've got a, I've got an advanced degree. I've, I've worked for X, Y, and Z company. And, and, and that would be valued at, depending on where I am, in certain areas, that would be valued at whatever, $250,000 a year. Well, the job only pays $80,000 a year. Take it or leave it. If you don't want it, I've got 10 other people lined up to, to take that job, right? So right. what's happened now is because of the pandemic, we, we, we had to work from home. And not only did we have to work from home, but what, what people realize and companies realize is, oh man, they're right. We can get work done. Not only could we get work done, we can actually get more work done because we can have Zooms. We can expand our reach across the globe via Zoom and other- For less money. Technology. For less money, no overhead. You don't have to pay for these big offices. It's It really is kind of an amazing thing. So so the first thing is that freedom of your of your of of the place that you occupy. Right. The pandemic gave the opportunity to say, listen, I want to work from home. Uh, this is what I want to do. I feel comfortable. Home. And by the way, since I can do everything digitally, my home doesn't have to be within pro a close proximity to the office. I can work from home from anywhere as long as I have a digital con Internet connection and digital. Right. So now I've yep. got freedom of my personal space and now freedom of time because I can be productive no matter when it is. So many more freedoms have cre have been created during this time frame that people also feel that they don't have to go work in a nine to five jobs, that the nine to five jobs really are lack of freedom because they're being forced to do things, being forced to work with the public 
who still, you know, half the public is still, you know, arguing about masks and and, and vaccinations, right? So right. if you're front facing, you don't want to work with those people. You don't want to have to endure that of which you're just, you know, you're just the manager of the, of the you know, of the Ralphs. You're just the bank teller. Like you're not setting policy and yet you have to endure a lot of the public, of the people who fly planes, right? So, um, so anyways, all that to say that if you've been working in a job, you finally at some point you're like, you know what? I don't have to do this. I don't have to be subjected to the rules that you've set for me. You told me when I had to go away and not work from the office, you set new parameters for my working away from the office. And now you're dictating that I have to come to the office, get vaccinated, do stuff. I don't want to work for you. I don't want to and do that's, that. And that's the neurotypical path. Add Correct. to that, I was getting there. The, com yeah. the component yes. of, of therapy um, appointments, you know, needing to have some sense of flexibility in order to be able to, you know, make runs, moves, trips, errands, those, those types of things, all the things that come with our experience. For sure. Well, that's what I was, I was, I was, I was going to get to the point. So first of all, just to answer the question about the great resignation yeah. is we're finding that especially our millennials and people who have been in the workforce now just long enough to know that the, that uh, the just over broke the oxymoron of job security is not worth it any longer those folks are resigning and, and leaving their jobs in massive numbers, massive numbers, and looking for new opportunities. Also, multiple streams of revenue have become the thing, so that they've involved in a number of kinds of things that can generate revenue on their own time and their own freedom. We've also seen a change in education because one of the things that we saw is, again, when our kids were homeschooled, the folks that had the biggest challenge with being homeschooled on uh, using the computers were those children who had, you know, who had some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of cognitive, you know, issue or, or a disability or, you know, an IEP. To anybody who was on an IEP for sure. Yeah. And by the way, I'm going to say that there are people who are not on IEP who also struggle with that. Some people who have, no, no, by the way, some people who have, who have social disorder, you know, a, a, kind of a, a, an issue around, around social you know, overwhelm, yeah, yeah. social, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a, it became a freedom for them because they could get the schoolwork and they could do it, they could have it, but not be. I don't have to be too close to you. I don't have to be in a, in a setting with a lot of people. So again, it created opportunity for us to look at how we learn and how we learn differently. And so you're right. In some cases, it was a huge challenge to have your have your children again on the autism spectrum or or or, or folks who have ADD or ADHD to you know be able to focus on a. 42 minute class on zoom where the teacher was talking at a screen of people that's a challenge right so so the challenges of of physical therapies and occupational therapies and speech therapies and stuff that is generally done in person became that became a challenge as well and so for folks who are smart and are answering you know the challenges um the the idea that you know that you could that you could have access now to the things in the metaverse to solve your problem. Basically it's created some fluidity, which I think we needed to create some fluidity around the rigidity of education and the rigidity right. of our workplace and the rigidity of a lot of the things that we, you know, that we're used to because that rigidity creates exactly what you talked about automatons, you know, and mm -hmm. people who are just phoning it in, go home, you know, take the kids to school, come home, turn on the TV, you know, watch some daytime television, whatever. Right. And just phone, phone it in. We're, we're, we're challenging that, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, most definitely. Because again, the, the sneaky thing about that, what's really deceptive about that is that you don't even really know you're doing that. And like, if somebody simply asks you about it, it's like having a pebble, you know, or a stone or a boulder, depending on how it's said, just dropped into what is usually a seamless stream. You know, and you can usually right. see it in somebody's face as you start talking to people about, you know, maybe what they want to do and where they want to be. And just, whoa, wait, I hadn't really thought about that before. So, again, that is, again, something that is part of and important to the human spirit, which is thinking of your existence and making the most out of your time here on this planet. Um, but, again, affects our community tenfold, which leads to the next topic, which sort of weaves in with it together, which is financial literacy, financial uh, education, because that is what we do. And we're committed to bringing, um, building a bridge between 
financial service, education, and opportunity, and the special needs community. Um, this is obviously something that we've talked about before, but I see, it, it seems as though I keep finding, especially as I sit with clients and we're helping them with plans, looking at retirement, income protection, and you know all those different things, I'm still blown away, like every third client with regard to how much it's needed and how much it's taken for granted. And I obviously, obviously know the answer. You know, one of the chats I was on, uh, I saw someone post a, you know, make a post where they were talking about how worried they are about um, their child with special needs and the fact that they don't have life insurance specifically. And somebody responded by saying, why would you be worried about life insurance? And I knew for a minute mm -hmm. when they asked that question, it was again, because the pebble of the bowler hadn't been dropped into their stream and they're just going about their business and they're kind of like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that before. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's just, it's 10 times as important because the other thing that people are thinking about with regard to the pandemic is their own mortality, you know, the quality of life For sure. as well as the quantity. You're like, what do I do with the years that I have left? And in some cases, depending on age or their own health or just people around them, they're also worried about, how long am I going to be here too? So that's where all of these things come into play. So um, let me play devil's advocate as though I don't know. And I'm quote unquote interviewing you, with you which feels kind of odd because we just have conversations. But <laughs> <laughs> for those that are listening that wouldn't know, talk about, you know, why the basic financial literacy and education is important, generally speaking, um, why it's important for the special needs community, and then why it's especially important right now when we are in the age of COVID. Because make no mistake about it, no matter how many advances they made with the vaccine, we are in the age of COVID. If the, vac if, 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 if the virus itself is wiped out tomorrow, we still can't put the genie back in the bottle. We're in a new age as a result of this thing. So touch sure. on that if you will. For sure. Let me just answer, just, just comment on that, because the, the reality is that, you know, it's called COVID-19 for a reason. This is the 19th iteration of COVID. COVID actually, and, a, and, a, and the potential of a global pandemic, that concept has been around forever and ever and ever. You, you know mm -hmm. that when they make a movie about, about a global pandemic. Several, it's, yeah. it's, 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 in the, it's in the ecosystem enough that, you know, we got to write, make a movie about what could possibly happen. Unfortunately, in the movies, everybody wins and everybody's fine. Everybody's great. We don't talk about the death and the fact that, you know, two, over two million people around the world have died of COVID-19. Um, but anyways, we're in the age and we're now dealing with it on a global scale, which I think is great. First of all, I, uh, second thing I, I want to comment and Gillian Giorgio, who's who's been commenting here um, on a couple of things on our Facebook um, comments, um, it has a podcast as well. Uh, she, uh, she goes by GG Inspire. I encourage people to do that. She is actually... Um, she is actually helping female entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, uh, look at new opportunities and and talking about the 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 the, the great opportunities, the challenges that come with all of that. Um, so definitely encourage you to to look up Gigi Inspire. Uh, she's amazing. She's in our space as well. We have these conversations on a regular basis too. Um, and the fact that you know a lot of women fall under this lack of financial information, and because you know because societal society has, you know, sort of dictated these sort of, you know, social mores where, you know, the men brought home the bacon and, you know, it, it's, such, it's like it's 80 years old now. I mean, that stuff doesn't really exist that way any longer. However, some of the habits, you know, STEM, right, science, you know, math, mathematics, you know, those 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 courses that are, are generally the harder sciences have been predominantly male dominated. And so when you see, a, you know, a young woman, it, you know, uh, excel in, in, in STEM education, you know, we celebrate because it doesn't happen very much. So again, that transition is happening as well. So just as women are transitioning into roles of the, of, you know, hard sciences and leading, you know, financial organizations and leading, you know, scientific organizations, lead all that, we really need, you know, we need to create some e egalitarian, some, e some equality here um, around who gets information about, about finance, because not only is it, is there a gender difference, but it, there's a difference between the 1% and everybody else. So those folks that are in the 1%, we call them the one percenters, um, those folks get access to financial information because they're, they're just because sometimes they do it out of, you know, out of um, uh, inheritance. <laughs> sometimes they do it out of successful performance. Sometimes they do it, you know, they're, because they're just in the right place at the right time. But for the most part, the one percenters become, and this is a thing that happened during the pandemic, the top 1%. Their, their, their overall 
uh, wealth of the top 1% grew trillions of dollars. What I would say, just looking at the average American family, the average American family, their wealth also increased because people weren't spending money out in the world. They were keeping it. They were saving it. But their average, the average increased only in the thousands of dollars, whereas opposed to we're talking about trillions of dollars for, for the wealthy. So it shows you there's a huge distinction, there's a huge difference between the wealthy 1% and everybody else. The thing that I love about the, comp the work that we do in our company is that we want everybody to be on an equal playing field. Doesn't matter where you come from, mm -hmm. what what your gender, your culture, your religion, doesn't matter where you are. You want to, want to have a, equal access, no family left behind, equal access to financial information. Yeah, you do this if do this if it will, Brian, indulge me, because I know whether they're listening live, whether they're listening on WSDX or they're listening on one of the podcast out, out, um, uh, platforms or on YouTube, there are some people that just heard about that disparity and right away their thought is, Yes, that's because the system is rigged that way or that there's, you know, some kind of catch. And they may even think that it's their destiny to not be one of the 2% and that that's the reason why it's set up that way because they're just, you know, they're just set up to fail. Comment on that and address that because I know there are people that are thinking that. Well, <laughs> first of all, I'm going to say you're not wrong, right? The system is, the system was designed in a certain, in a, you know, in a certain way. And by the way, this is not a U.S. centric conversation. This is a right. global conversation. The the you know the word democracy, which is supposed to create is supposed to create a sense of of again equality across all demographics. Um, that term democracy came around during the times of Aristotle, Plato, and and the, and what they tried to do is they tried to create a level playing field, which was fine, except that the landowners were like, uh, wait, you want us to share our? You mean with everybody else? You want us to? Mm, yeah. Democracy for everybody, but not 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 as it relates to our ownership of our land. So this idea between the landowner and the land worker and the difference between those has been going on since the beginning of time. And so in some ways, the systems that exist today are a direct outlet of that, you know, of of of, of systems that have existed forever. And yes, there have been, look, we've talked about Black Wall Street, we've talked about issues where the certain areas. Um, of our communities that have been not just not just left out of the conversation, but actually discouraged to shoved participate out. in the conversation, shoved out and and given their options, um, you know, a, a good squashing uh, that has to change. And I think we're starting to see a lot of the a lot of the unrest and a lot of the divide that's happening in the country now is more along the lines of those that have been shut out of the conversation versus those that have been that have been per perpetuating the conversation. Right. And that is so. Those are these are good changes to have. I don't know if I'm addressing exactly what you, yes. what you're what you're talking about. But the reality is, while those things have been forced, the system has existed there. There's also opportunity, no matter where you are and no matter what you where you come from. You just have to you have to remove yourself from the from the mental idea that the concept of I'm being left out or I'm being shut out or this is working against me, because the reality is. If you could, if you look for it and you seize it and take advantage of it and not be not be shut out and not allow that to happen, you can actually succeed at every level here. You can be landowner. You can be in the top one percent. I would love the top one percent to be the top ninety nine percent. You yeah. know, if yeah. we had our way. Uh, and and you know, anyways, I just think that there's opportunity for us to have, you know, for us to be to give folks the idea. And by the way, folks in the special needs community feel that they're also left out of the conversation. And partially mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the system too, because, because the main focus is always on what's right in front of me, which I think is, is, is indicative of what happens to a lot of people left out of the conversation, which is, yeah. which is, you know, I'm focused on my sustenance. What, what, how do I, how's my child going to get through school, live independently, drive a car, have a job, have a life and a life that exists independently after I die, after I pass away, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the forefront of most special needs parents, families of special needs children when it comes to their, to their child, right? And so, so the idea of yeah. financial support is, is sort of like, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of that. Let's take care of this stuff first. But that right. fits in for everybody. Several things there I want to unpack from everything that you said, which is that, you know, both communism and capitalism were created to sort of give an equal shot or or uh, or or level things up for any and everybody the problem with both is that there's the human element 
right? What happens when people have power and it goes to their heads? And that's a problem for anybody, generally speaking. That's twice as much of a problem for people um, that are members of the special needs community, whether you have a diagnosis or you're a caregiver. Now, with that being said, and the United States being far from the epitome of perfection, <laughs> there is no better place to be than to embody the following thought, which is that despite what seems to have been put in place and has in fact been put in place systematically to disenfranchise a minority community, whether it's um, African-Americans, Latinos, um, women, or members of the special needs community, which could be a sub, you know, community of all of those categories I just mentioned. Sure. The right. bottom line is, and I know sometimes, you know, it, it, it's hard and, and this might shock people. Sometimes it's hard for me too. <laughs> to not give in to the thought that this is difficult because of this thing that I'm dealing with. This is difficult because I don't know if you know, my child is going to have this level of independence and uh, all this kind of stuff. But the very same thing, the very same thing that might have you just sitting there saying that it's difficult, right, is also the reason why it is so worthwhile for one to think, no, no, no. If I just look for it, if I, first of all, make very clear what it is that I want, and then I'm determined to go find it, this is the best time and the best place in the world for that to go happen. 100%. I know sometimes that that is so, so, so hard to see. And I'm not speaking to the audience. I'm speaking with them because I need to be reminded of that at times as well. But that, that also goes back to, you know, if you take autism specifically, um, the spectrum is so wide. Encountering other people and their challenges, that's why we need each other too, because we need to be reminded that our biggest challenges, our biggest nightmares are somebody else's goals and dreams. Right, right. No, it's true. I, 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 heard, a, I heard a story when I was starting out in my entrepreneurial life that stuck with me forever. And I know this is a common anecdote that people you know, have heard some variation of. But, you know, the idea that um, that there are two brothers, right? One who's a very successful CEO of a company and and his brother who was living homeless on the street. And when they interviewed the homeless brother on the street, like, you know, what happened to you? Why are you here? What's what's led you to to this life? And he said, well, when I was younger, my father was an alcoholic and he came home and beat us all the time. And, you know, I had so many challenges. What did you expect to happen to me? Like, that's fascinating. And they asked the CEO, how did you become CEO of the most successful company here? And how are you in this position? How do you exist your de destiny in your life? And he said, well, my father was an alcoholic. And when he came home, he used to beat us. And I had all these challenges to overcome. And what did you expect to happen to me? So it's really like the circumstances exist. And it's what you make of the circumstances. And I think that, you know, at some point, there's the, the decision has to be made. This goes back to the conversation that we started earlier, which is what people are encountering today in this world, in our in our pandemic, we're like I don't know what there's pre and then there's post. What's it called when you're in it? You're it's like mid pandemic. I guess we're in the mid pandemic era that we're in, and eventually our post pandemic world is freedom, freedom to make the choices that have you get what it is that you want in life, that you live the life that you want, that you are you know where, when, how, with who and what you do with your life, right? The, the freedom has always been there. It's just been masked by a bunch of, of, you know, of structures that are artificial, that are, you know, that are, are set in place by somebody else. That's just a construct that can be changed. You know, we all agree that when we come to a, when we come to an intersection and there's a street light, we all agree that green means go and red means stop. And in fact, there are right. laws that say, if you violate this agreement, there's a consequence, right? Besides the possibility of a crash. But the reality is green means go and red means stop. And it exists. Now it exists in law, but it exists because we all have granted it existence. We all have agreed to live by that rule that to live in a, in a society, you know, that doesn't have chaos. If we want an orderly society, red means stop and green means go, right? By the way, we've also agreed that Government, you know, has a certain role and we've agreed that education has a role. We've agreed that a dollar is worth something because somebody is willing to exchange a good or a service for that dollar. That's all by agreement. I keep hitting my microphone today. I don't know what's going on. 
I'm very <laughs> handsy today. But the reality is we have granted a lot of this, um, a lot of these constructs, their existence out of agreement. And what yes. we're dealing with right now is we're dealing with a lot of folks that have a lot of disagreement. And while it looks like it's a bad thing and can be divisive, it's also a good thing because it creates opportunity, it creates opportunity to restate and re engage with these constructs and in, in, in a way that makes it say, wait, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to go to, listen, by the way, I, I went to, I went to college, I got undergraduate degree and a graduate degree, but in my family, you had to do that, right? That was the thing. You have to do this, right? If you want a successful career, you have to do this, but why? And some people are like, why? I don't know if my son's going to go to college or not. So, by the way, I'm not making it a mandate. If it's right for him and that's the thing that he wants to do, I totally encourage it. And my other daughter, Gabby, just graduated with honors from the University of Vermont with like three different degrees, like a major and like two minors and everything. And she, that's her, that was her choice. I, I would never have done that. That's not me. But that's her, that's what we're doing. The freedom of being able to decide what to do. The freedom mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur and, and learning about money, not being left out of the conversation, not allowing the status quo to exist. And if you're a family dealing with special needs issues to not take, you know, we're a perfect example. Do not take the statements that people make about your child as, as that's the Gospel. rule. That's the Bible. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. You, that is not it. They, you cannot put your child under, while there is an umbrella description of certain things, the reality is every child is unique as every person here is unique. And so if you have a child dealing with special needs, your child is unique and nobody should tell you what your child cannot do. And that is the prevalence. That's a prevalent conversation. They tell you what your child is not going to do in their life. And I'm testament to the fact that that's, oh, I almost said the rival said a bad word, Sean. That's BS is the word <laughs> I was going to say, right? It's BS, right? It is, it is all about you. You have, you have faith in who you are. And who you are in the world, who your family is, who they're going to become, what they're going to do, and you, and it is freedom. It is all about freedom, as Gillian put here. The focus is freedom, not money. It says not about finances, because the reality is, once you find your true freedom, your true purpose, your true north, as some people would say, right, where you're going, money comes. Money is going to be there because you're going to be doing something that you are really like you're lit up to do. You wake up every morning excited to do it. It it, it fulfills you. It feeds your soul, and it serves other people. And at the end of the day, when that happens, money comes, the universe takes care of you, you ask for it, you work hard for it, and it shows up. So right. it is, right, Sean Hall, it's your belief system. It is what, and I love, Sean, what you said, you know, you want to take the, so he put it up here on the, on the screen, if it shows up, yeah, take a victor rather than victim mentality. We yeah. are here to be victors in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, I get, I don't know why I'm lit up about it today, but the reality is, we care for our special needs families. We care for folks who need to understand about finances because the reality is there are so many tools. There are so many financial vehicles that exist that can change your world. You don't have to be stuck with putting your money in a bank and putting your retirement in a 401k and you know maybe dabbling in the stock market a little bit or maybe you buy a house and that's your real estate, that's your investment for your future. That doesn't have to be the way it is. In fact, that way is what... The establishment wants you to believe. And mm -hmm. that is where the challenge is. I promise you, if you're paying a mortgage, there's an alternative solution that changes the amount of money you pay the bank. If you put your money in 401k, I guarantee you there are places to put your money for your retirement for the long haul that are that don't pay the banks and don't pay the government more than they're entitled to. If and I'm you, gonna well, have your money in a savings account. There's places, other places you can put your money. If you're paying on a student loan, there are other places that you can put that money in your pocket, not in the pocket of the of the financiers who are who are compounding your interest on a daily basis for student loans. That is insane and, and unheard of. It's daily. bad enough to have your money compound annually or monthly, but your but your interest compounds daily on a student loans, and there are a ton of programs that the government that exists in the government to 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 not burden you with that kind of stuff. And that's the stuff that we talk about. And that's what people should be looking for and not accept the status quo of a document that's sent to them that says, well, now your $10,000 student loan is $40,000. We'd like you to pay that over the next 40 years of your life. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the closest that we've ever got gotten to a quote unquote plug for our financial services business or work. And the truth of the matter is it's an attempt. The closest we, we get to that is to promote a mission. 
not necessarily, you know, the service. Because, and, and this is for everyone out there, everyone, but this is especially to anyone who is a caregiver or parent to someone with special needs. Just as, as we all have a fight between the life that we have versus the one that we want, right? Both of those lives are fighting for our attention. Yeah. Oftentimes, more than not, the life that we have is kicking the butt of the one that we want. We might have even forgotten about that. But just remember, and again, it is easier said than done, but equally true and valuable. We can't be warriors and warriors. We have to end up being one of the two. And I, and I say that knowing that sometimes of the day we're more warrior, a warrior than warrior, but the warrior is who actually serves us, right? And when it comes to everything that we've just been talking about in terms of the financial instruments and everything, feel free to reach out to us. I mean, there's just, it, it, we're here to change lives one person at a time. Yeah, I, I was gonna just one quick thing because I know we're getting close to the end of our time. I just yeah. my my son plays baseball. That's his thing. It's his passion since he was like you know six years old or whatever. And the league that he plays in in here in Los Angeles is called <laughs> the Wilshire Warriors. And there was a time when our team was not very good, and we would go to tournaments and get just get destroyed. Uh, you know, fifteen nothing and sixteen to two. And Brian's and being nothing. modest. Brian is the coach. Well, I, I was the coach in the earlier days, and then and then as we began travel team, so 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 yeah, there's there's rec coaches and there's travel ball. The travel yeah. ball coaches were like, you know, listen, we're we become Wilshire Warriors is what we've become, and then in the last year during the pandemic, by the way, where these kids were not were not going to allow the the pandemic to shut down their their joy and their dream, they played with each other, right? They didn't play games because there were no organized games. But they played, they practiced, they worked out, they got conditioning. And this year, we are absolutely destroying other baseball teams. We have become the Wilshire Warriors again, as opposed to Wilshire Warriors, because they didn't allow this to stop them from their ultimate goal of becoming, you know, amazing ball players. And if you're big mm -hmm. fans and you watch the Dodger game last night, I'm not going to say because this could be airing at any time, but, you know, Comebacks are comebacks. The great game of baseball is about the great redemption. And it's such a great life lesson because you're not stuck in the world that you're living in right now. You're just the only thing where place you're stuck is in your is in your brain. If you're feeling that you're in a situation and you don't have an answer, you don't have a solution, reach out because there are people like Gillian and Sean Hall and Sean Francis and I that work in an area that help to get people to look at just different facets of the same world that give you options to, to explore. So we encourage you to do that. This is not a plug for us, but we know that in the great, as, as a great resignation is giving people freedom to choose what they want to do with their life. We're always looking for great people to join our business and join our crusade and go help as many communities. Sean and I chose that uh, Sean Hall and Adam Hancock have chosen the special needs community because we're members of that community. But any community that you're in that needs your help, that needs to be serviced, we want people to have to understand how these things work and how finances work. And in the new metaverse, how that's all going to be impacting as well, because that's all stuff to come in the future. Bitcoin, blockchain, all that stuff that's going to be changing our world in, in the metaverse of the future. You want to be you want to you want to know about it today because it's going to have a huge difference. So on that note, I'll stop talking. I only <laughs> had one cup of coffee. Today. I don't know what's going on today, but I love this topic. Um, and I'll just end the way I always end, which is, you know, now more than ever. Uh, empathy and love should dictate everything that we do, right? Look at somebody with a sense of empathy. Understand they're going through something that you may not have any understanding about. So have some empathy for those folks that you may not understand, or you may not agree, or may not just, you just can't comprehend what is it they're actually going through. And then if you look through the world, with the world, you look at the world through a lens of love, the world is just a better place. The world just looks different when it's through the lenses of love. So I encourage you to have empathy and love no matter what you do. I love you. I appreciate you listening, sharing your thoughts, commenting, subscribing, share with your friends. Thank you for being here. And Sean, and for everybody listening on our podcast and on WSCXM Radio, we love you too. Sean Francis, I love you too. And I know you want to end us, close us out for today, but I love being a partner with you, my friend. Love you right back. And I'll make sure that I'm really uh, nice and quick about this. I, I have to share these words that I got from you, which you got from someplace. Don't even remember where, but you know, it is said that the, the wealthiest man in the world. So from the great Mansa Musa, the wealthiest person ever, all the way to Jeff Bezos, no man's wealth will allow him to stop time. And the poorest of men today can still change the world tomorrow. That's something to remember. And remember everybody, 
someplace needs to know that they're loved, needs to know that they're heard, needs to know that they're seen. I want to make sure that I, uh, I thank the women in my life without whom I could not even begin to attempt to be the best that I can. And that means my, my mom, Jan, and my amazing wife, Laura, and wherever you are, make sure that you, um, um, you know, you tune in. We thank you for doing so today, everyone home in the U S Virgin islands. And if you're watching us, we love you. We'll see you next time. See you next time, everybody. Thank you again.